German-occupied Poland, late 1940. A crowd of SS soldiers board their transport truck and drive away from a clearing in the middle of nowhere. Behind them, they have left a patch of freshly turned earth. Beneath that earth lies the bodies of hundreds of innocent civilians. The soldiers were now moving on to the next village to do it all over again. Today, Descent into Darkness investigates the shameful precursor to the Holocaust in the Einsatzgruppen, Hitler's death squads. Background The Einsatzgruppen, or task groups, began their life in the mind of the Nazi Reich's sickest and most insidious mind, Reinhard Heydrich. The man immediately below SS boss Heinrich Himmler, Heydrich was the dashing former sailor who, thanks to his high connections and ruthless efficiency, found himself indispensable to Hitler's bureaucratic machine. He had founded the Sicherheitsdienst, or SD, the security service, and had risen all the way up to the head of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, or Reich's main security office in Berlin, which was in overall charge of all of the different police and counter-espionage branches throughout Germany, including the aforementioned SD, the Kriminalpolizei, or Kripo, and the Geheimstaatspolizei, or Gestapo. So it is safe to say that if there was anything worth knowing in Nazi Germany, Heydrich was the one that knew it. But behind his chiselled facade lay a deeply nasty individual with a rabid anti-Semitic streak that was fully indoctrinated with the regime's propaganda. On the evening of the 30th of June 1934, he had been instrumental in organising the brutal Night of the Long Knives, that dealt with several members of the command structure of the brown-shirted Sturmabteilung, or SA, the Nazi party's thuggish enforcers. The SA, in Hitler's eyes, had become far too powerful, and no doubt influenced by poison dripped into his ear from his personal secretary, Martin Bormann, the organisation, and in particular its influential leader, Ernst Röhm, posed an imminent threat to Hitler's power. Members of the more elite Schutzstaffel, or SS, in one single night set about either arresting or murdering the entirety of the SA's high command. Despite Ernst Röhm being alongside Hitler since the very beginning, he was arrested and presented with trumped-up charges of sedition. There were also rumours that he was homosexual, which was very much frowned upon. Röhm knew that the writing was on the wall for him. The SA virtually collapsed overnight leaving the SS as the only paramilitary force. When the Nazis took over the rest of what is now the Czech Republic in March of 1939, after having first secured the Sudetenland thanks to the Munich Agreement of the previous year, Heydrich was quick to root out any and all resistance to the Czech's new German overlords. He quickly moved to the Czech capital of Prague, set up shop and began exacting a swift and ruthless programme of counter-espionage. Anyone who was even remotely associated with Czech resistance was instantly arrested and dragged away for questioning, which almost always involved confessions extracted through torture. Once a confession was gotten, this was all the proof that was needed to condemn that person to death. Coupled to this was the desire to rid the whole of the new territory of its Jewish population. Czech Jews were rounded up and interned until they could be shipped out. In the process, a lot of people who attempted to resist were either severely beaten or shot. All of this led to Heydrich being dubbed the Butcher of Prague. In September of 1939, the invasion of Poland commenced, following a false flag operation in which Germans disguised as Poles attacked a German border crossing checkpoint. The Nazi High Command had been planning the invasion for a long time. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact had ensured that the Soviet Union was not going to intervene after being promised half of Poland in exchange for unharmonious existence between the two extreme polar opposite political regimes. This being despite the fact that the Nazis hated communists even more than they hated Jews. For the time being, it made sense to keep the Reds sweet. The Poles put up a spirited yet ultimately futile defence against the invasion of their sovereign territory. The only positive effect of the invasion was the declaration of war from Britain and France who had guaranteed Polish autonomy following the First World War. 
By mid-1941, there were still just under 350,000 Jews still living in Germany that had not voluntarily emigrated elsewhere. Himmler had been reluctant to begin mass deportations until the war was over, whenever that may have been, as he feared that the upheaval might cause severe public backlash that the Nazi regime simply did not have the resources to deal with. However, with no end in sight for the foreseeable future, Himmler, Heydrich and Adolf Eichmann had begun exploring different options. They settled on evacuating them further east, but this quickly proved to be simply shifting the problem, and was proving a mammoth task in terms of resources and bureaucracy. Before the war, Eichmann had even visited Palestine with a view to deporting Europe's Jews there, but this was found to be unworkable in the numbers that they were expecting. With the regime not wanting to be responsible for even more Jews in their new territories, it was thought that it was far simpler to begin eliminating them entirely. This, in essence, is what led to the seeds of the Holocaust, first planted when many people had blamed the Jews for Germany's surrender all the way back in 1918, to begin sprouting. The Einsatzgruppen Heydrich had called for volunteers for a special job from the various police branches that he was in charge of. He had no shortage of volunteers putting themselves forward for this new job, around 2,700 initially, but this number would ultimately grow to 4,257 officers and men. All the volunteers would be officially taken into the SS and given SS ranks, which were named completely different from the army to avoid confusion and to set them apart as elites. There had initially been some friction between the army and the SS about who was in charge of what, and some jealousy that the squads were not fighting like the rest of them. But Himmler quickly issued an order to Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel that specifically gave the Einsatzgruppen complete autonomy from the German army and allowed them to operate independently, despite being attached to the army. The task groups were organised into individual battalions that would shadow the advancing front lines. This would be further subdivided into smaller units called Einsatzkommandos. Einsatzgruppe 1, commanded by ss Standartenführer Bruno Steckenbach, acted with the 14th Army. Einsatzgruppe 2, commanded by ss Obersturmbannführer Emanuel Schäfer, acted with the 10th Army. Einsatzgruppe 3, under ss Obersturmbannführer Herbert Fischer, acted with the 8th Army. Einsatzgruppe Wehr, under SS Brigadeführer Lothar Beutel, acted with the 4th Army. Einsatzgruppe 5, under SS Standartenführer Ernst Damsog, acted with the 3rd Army. Einsatzgruppe 6, under SS Oberführer Erich Naumann, acted in the Wielkopolska region. Einsatzgruppe 7, under SS Obergruppenführer Udo von Wroisch and SS Gruppenführer Otto Rasch, acted in acted in Upper Silesia. In essence, the idea was that, as new territory was conquered, these separate squads of men would follow close behind, and every settlement, no matter how small, would forcibly round up every Jew or communist sympathiser, loaded onto trucks and taken away. Once out in the middle of nowhere, and away from prying eyes, the trucks would be unloaded, and the people forced to dig a large, deep trench. Then, they would be ordered to strip naked and herded in groups into the trench and line up. Then the men of the Einsatzgruppen would line up along the edge of the trench, take aim and fire. Any that had not been instantly killed would receive a second shot from an officer's pistol or an NCO's submachine gun. Then the next group would be beaten forward into the trench, climbing over the bodies of the last batch. And so on, until they were all dead. Once there was no one left, the trench would be covered over, sometimes with lime to hasten decomposition. The personal possessions all gathered up, and the Einsatzgruppen would move on to the next settlement. Town after town, village after village, the mass murders carried inexorably on. What is worse is that the local populace were only too happy to assist the Nazis in the task. There are many instances of the settlements, Jews being essentially lynched before they were brought to their new masters. Many people in Eastern Europe could remember the Russian pogroms of the mid to late 1800s, and anti-Semitism was still rife in these regions, 
particularly the further east one went, with many even volunteering to take an active part in the shootings. And, of course, there were many men from the Wehrmacht only too happy to assist the squads in rounding people up. When it came to the big cities of Poland, the Einsatzgruppen were given the job of bringing all the remaining Jews into the ghettos. Small areas of the cities specially set aside for them, which were walled in and intentionally far smaller than they needed to be to house the numbers. Multiple families were forced to live in squalid conditions in cramped houses and be forced to work as part of the massive slave labour workforce that all of the Nazis perceived undesirables were part of. Some of the very lucky few would end up working in the enamelware factory owned by Oskar Schindler, but that is a story for another day. Evidence of these ghettos can still be seen in many cities of Eastern Europe to this day. When the mass deportations had begun from Germany in the autumn of 1941, they too were crammed into the already overpopulated ghettos. With the commencement of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, the Einsatzgruppen kicked into high gear and had been expanded and reorganised under the following lines. Einsatzgruppe A, commanded by SS Brigadefuhrer Dr. Franz Walter Stalecker, operated in the Baltic states, such as Estonia, Lithuania, etc. Einsatzgruppe B, commanded by SS Brigadefuhrer Arthur Neber, operated in Belarusia, modern-day Belarus. Einsatzgruppe C, commanded by SS Gruppenführer Otto Rasch, operated in northern and central Ukraine. Einsatzgruppe D, commanded by SS Gruppenführer Professor Otto Ollendorf, operated in Bessarabia, southern Ukraine, Crimea and the Caucasus. Einsatzgruppe E, commanded by SS Oberstobannführer Ludwig Teichmann, operated in Croatia. Einsatzgruppe F, operated with Army Group South, although I was unable to find out who commanded it. Einsatzgruppe G, commanded by SS Standarteführer Dr. Josef Kreutzer, operated in Romania, Hungary and the Ukraine. Einsatzgruppe H, commanded by Oberstobannführer Josef Vitiska, operated in Slovakia. Einsatzgruppe Griechenland, commanded by SS Stombanführer Dr. Ludwig Hahn, operated in Greece. Einsatzgruppe Iltis, commanded by SS Standartenführer Paul Blobel, operated in Carinthia and Slovenia. And Einsatzgruppe Serbian, commanded by SS Standartenführer Wilhelm Fuchs, operated in Yugoslavia. Along with this, Quite extensive list were further groups that operated in Norway and Luxembourg and North Africa, as well as two more that were proposed to operate in the Middle East and in Britain if those invasions had happened. The Germans hated the Soviets far more than they did Jews, although Nazi ideology considered them to be connected to each other, seeing Bolshevism as a Jewish-made conspiracy to spite them and to control Europe. They saw communists and Jews as subhuman, not worthy of anything other than death. Himmler had stated in meetings leading up to the invasion of the Soviet Union that it was the intention to reduce the Soviet population by at least 30 million people through a combination of murders and forced starvation. Little did they know, of course, that Stalin had had the exact same idea and had been carrying it out ever since he had come to power. It is important to remember that these ideals were not exclusive to the SS. To emphasise Hitler's orders that the Wehrmacht must cooperate and afford the Einsatzgruppen every assistance in their duties, Field Marshal Walter von Reichenau drafted a letter to the Sixth Army. Known as the Severity Order, here are some extracts from it. The most important objective of this campaign against the Jewish Bolshevik system is the complete destruction of its source of power and the extermination of the Asiatic influence in European civilization. In this Eastern theater, the soldier is not only a man fighting in accordance with the rules of the art of war, but also the ruthless standard bearer of a national conception. For this reason, the soldier must learn fully to appreciate the necessity for the severe but just retribution that must be meted out against the subhuman species of Jewry. Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt expressed his complete agreement with this order. Furthermore, Field Marshal Erich von Manstein later wrote to his own men that 
the Jewish Bolshevist system must be exterminated once and for all. Manstein also wrote to the commander of Gruppe D, expressing his annoyance that his men were getting all of the wristwatches from the murdered victims and not sharing them with the army. Sounds like a lovely bloke. The most infamous incident of mass murder by the Einsatzgruppen was carried out between the 29th and 30th of September 1941 in a large ravine northwest of the city of Kiev in the Ukraine. The Jewish civilian population of Kiev were ordered to report to a point not far from the main railway station on the 29th. A total of 33,771 people turned up, assuming that they were to be deported as news of the mass killings had not yet reached the city. They were all marched away with whatever worldly possessions they could carry and taken to a place outside the city. The name of that place was Babi Yar. Here, in groups of around 40 at a time, people were beaten and chivied forward into the ravine, which was lined with men of Einsatzgruppe C, along with more men from the Ukrainian police forces who had helped round up the local Jewish people. Over the next two days, all of the just under 34,000 men, women and children were shot. And if you wish to know more of the finer details of the Babi Yar massacre, I shall leave you a link in the description to Dr. Mark Felton's brilliant three-part video series that covers it. But this was by no means an isolated incident. Many more such mass shootings took place until in December of 1941, when the Einsatzgruppen declared that all the areas in which they operated were now completely free of Jews. This represented a total of around 450 to 500,000 people murdered. However, when one takes into account the Slavs and Roma, and the fact that the Einsatzgruppen continued to operate until 1944, the total number of murdered reaches a shocking 1.5 to 2 million people. Of these, around 1.3 million were Jews. Not all of these were carried out exclusively by them. They had also an unquantified amount of assistance from the Ukrainian police, as well as sympathetic forces in Yugoslavia and Romania. As the war dragged on and the British naval blockade coupled with the stiffening Soviet resistance began to bite, shortages of essentials back in Germany had caused low morale on the home front. Of course, the Nazis played this to their advantage and blamed all of the shortages on the Jews and the Communists, which in turn led to Himmler paying many visits to the front and demanding an escalation in the murders in the occupied territories. He was adamant that this would cure the problems at home, which was all the encouragement the men needed to redouble their efforts. In true Germanic efficiency, records were kept of exactly how many people had been killed. For example, this document, known as the Jaeger Report, shows Einsatzkommando 3, a subunit of Gruppe A, having murdered 137,346 people between early June and late November of 1941. The following February, this figure was amended to 138,272, with a breakdown of 48,242 men, 55,556 women and 34,464 children. Of these, only 1,851 people were not Jewish. Two more groups were created in the winter of 1944 and 45, specifically to shadow the Ardennes Offensive, more commonly known as the Battle of the Bulge, where Germany threw everything they had against the Western Allies in one last major offensive action. In this, they were highly successful, managing to overrun and push back a massive number of Allied units, proving once again that their much-famed blitzkrieg tactics and extensive distribution of methamphetamine were difficult to counter. Indeed, the offensive only eventually failed when the armoured units ran out of their precious fuel, and simply could not continue and reinforce their gains. Problems Despite regular rotations of active duties, the mass executions were having a severe effect on the mental health of the men. Whilst more closely associated with the First World War, where it was first identified on a mass scale, 
the men of the Einsatzgruppen were suffering from a form of shell shock. Whilst no one in their right mind would ever sympathise with men who were doing some of the evilest acts in human history, it is interesting to at least look at such things and see what was going on in their heads. What we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, the symptoms of the problem can be a combination of tremors, fatigue, confusion, night terrors, impaired hearing and vision, and severe psychosis. These symptoms can be only temporary, or in more extreme cases, permanent, and can be highly damaging for the sufferer, not only to themselves, but to those around them. Far too many of the men were suffering irreparable effects, the reports of which were slowly trickling back to high command, causing much consternation, with many men taking to extreme alcohol abuse as a coping mechanism. This would result in inefficiencies, such as men being incapable due to being too drunk, or not being able to even shoot straight. Some had outright broken and refused to participate. At the opposite end of the scale, there were those who were judged to have become too brutal, and had to be taken off execution duties. Seems a bit of an oxymoron, but there we are. Heinrich Himmler had been present to witness one of these mass shootings in Minsk in August of 1941, and had been thoroughly appalled by it to the point where he had vomited. He came away from the scene determined that a better and more efficient and less harrowing way should be sought. Himmler had never served in a combat force, a fact that had stung his personal pride, but it also meant that he was not familiar with the sights and sounds of death, and his first proper experience of it had disturbed him. But still, he remained resolute that the killings were necessary, but the current method was simply unsustainable. He just had to find a better way. Promising reports had come from the men tasked with carrying out the mass euthanasia program known as Action T4, which had experimented with specially adapted vans that would pipe exhaust directly into the cargo bay, suffocating those inside. This had piqued the interest of the SS, who slowly began the transition towards the use of gas vans at the Einsatzgruppen. But the men still had problems with this, as having to drag the bodies out of the vans and bury them was still a harrowing ordeal. And, given that when one dies, the bladder and bowels tend to void due to the muscles relaxing, it was also quite a disgusting one. Himmler instituted a system of provisions that gave the men a lot of rest time and close monitoring of their mental health, whilst alternatives were sought. Aftermath With the mounting report of the men suffering their various problems with their psyche, on the 20th of January 1942, at the Villa Am Grossen in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee, Reinhard Heydrich chaired a meeting of several top Nazis, including Adolf Eichmann, the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller, the infamous Screaming Judge, Roland Freisler, and the head of the Race and Settlement Office, Otto Hoffmann. This meeting was to discuss the one item on the agenda, Die Endlosung der Judenfrage, the final solution to the Jewish question. This would hear the reports of various small-scale experiments performed in the basement of the punishment block of the first Auschwitz concentration camp, as well as the Aktion T4 mass euthanasia program. Instead of the previous ideas of the combination of mass deportation and resettlement and the actions of the Einsatzgruppen, this meeting settled upon the idea of the wholesale extermination of the entirety of Europe's Jewish population not only in the current territory that Germany controlled, but in all new territory they intended to acquire going forward, estimated to be around 11 million people. This two-hour-long meeting would be the beginning of the death camps that the Holocaust is most known for, and where previously unknown names such as Auschwitz, Treblinka and others would enter the annals of dark history. But part of this whole story does bear at least one modicum of a happy ending. On the 27th of May 1942, Heydrich had been travelling to, to a meeting with Hitler back in Germany. As his convertible Mercedes-Benz 320 approached the junction of the Prague-Dresden Road on its way to an awaiting aircraft, two men, Jan Kubisch and Josef Gabczyk, stepped out into the road and took aim with a Sten submachine gun at the staff car.
The two Czech men had been trained the previous year by the British Special Operations Executive, or SOE, on behalf of the Czechoslovak government in exile in London. The driver of the car, named Klein, had seen the men step out in front of the car and took evasive action to avoid the attack. Gabchik's gun had malfunctioned and had failed to go off. Heydrich had ordered the car to stop so that they could both confront the failed gunman. When the car stopped, Kubisch threw a specially converted anti-tank mine at the car. It was a good throw. The bomb exploded right beside the vehicle's rear wheel. Heydrich suffered severe internal injuries to his diaphragm and to his spleen, causing massive internal bleeding. But he was not yet out for the count. He ordered a relatively uninjured Klein to chase the men down, but by this time Gabchik had managed to get his gun working and had shot Klein, injuring him and putting him out of action. Both Czech agents had got away, leaving both Heydrich and Klein laying wounded, waiting for someone to come to their aid. A civilian woman discovered the injured Germans and flagged down a delivery truck that took them both to hospital. Heydrich died eight days later, on the 4th of June, after falling into a coma the previous day. One of the many heads of the Nazi snake had been severed in a blow of triumph for the Czech resistance, and a nice, big, juicy fuck you to the Nazi sense of invincibility. Heydrich was buried with all the pomp and ceremony that the Nazis could organise. Hitler was furious when he heard about the assassination and had ordered it that thousands of Czech civilians should be randomly selected for execution as reprisals, but in a rare occasion of sense, he was talked out of it. Both Kubisch and Gabchik, along with a handful of other members of the Czech resistance, had taken refuge in the crypt of the Cathedral of St. Cyril and Methodius in Prague, but they were tracked down and were quickly surrounded by over 800 men of the SS and Gestapo. The surrounding forces breached the door of the cathedral with explosives and closed in. Rather than surrender or risk capture, which they all knew would involve an untold amount of horrific torture and a slow death, the Czech men chose to take their own lives. The planned extermination programme went ahead with a new name coined by Heydrich's replacement, Ernst Kaltenbronner. He had decided to name it after the man who had come up with the idea, the man whom he had replaced. Aktion Reinhard was born. With the rapid advance of the Red Army in late 1944, all of the Einsatzgruppen operating in the east were disbanded and the men incorporated into the main combat units to maximise the manpower available to fight the Soviet forces, but, as we know, this did not end well for them. Following the war, there was a concerted effort to hunt down the men responsible for these mass murders, Many of the commanding officers would face justice for their crimes against humanity. Legacy The Einsatzgruppen represented a, only a taster of what was yet to come with the commencement of Aktion Reinhard, which would see dramatic expansion of the concentration camp system and the creation of three new camps that were dedicated killing factories. These were at Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor. Unlike their much bigger sister camps, these would only need to be very small. Of all new arrivals that were sent to these camps, around 95% and upwards would be sent to be immediately murdered in the gas chambers, save only for a short time to shave everyone's heads and have them stripped naked. They would be driven to their deaths by screaming guards and the gnashing teeth of dogs. Anyone who attempted to resist would be immediately and coldly shot. To this day, there are places all over the Polish countryside that contain yet undiscovered places where men, women and children were shot and buried. Whole families and multiple generations of people whose names are almost lost to history. And yet, despite all of this, there are instances of people living to tell the tale of these death squads, with one or two of those being herded into the mass pits, finding themselves miraculously untouched by the shooting, wisely keeping still until the squad had left the area. The men who committed these disgusting acts of cold-blooded murder fully deserve to live out the rest of their days with their dreams haunted by the screams and the sights of those they killed. <laughs>
It is staggering and shocking just how many people were more than willing to help out in this mass slaughter, whether they be military or civilian. A damning indictment of humans' propensity to destroy one another. In the modern day, with almost all of these evildoers dead and gone, we must do all we can not only to educate ourselves in what happened, but to learn exactly why it happened, and vow never to repeat those mistakes in the hopes that one day the scars will be healed. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and interesting. If you did, please smash the old like button and consider sharing it with a friend to help the video reach a wider audience. The subject matter of a lot of these videos inevitably leads to demonetization, and so I would greatly appreciate not only the wider reach, but also if you are able to contribute either regularly through my Patreon page linked below, or via the Super Thanks button. This helps me continue on making these videos and presenting them for your consumption. A huge thank you to my current patrons, all of you are amazing, and the faith that you place in me is never taken for granted. And if you can't get enough of the notorious DID, head on over to my alternate channel DID Reads to hear more. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves, and I shall see you on our next descent into darkness.